So to sum it up, not only did the volume of southern cotton sales fall, but that which did sell sold for a lower price for lack of demand. This caused a depression through the cotton producing regions of the South. As the effect of the tariff of 1816 became clear, my views changed from protectionist to free trader. But that took time, almost four years. I eventually reached the point of no return late in 1828, the fourth year of my term as vice president under President Adams. Historians will say that at that time, I moved from nationalist to nullifier. Now the tariff of 1828, the period of time when I moved to nullifier. The immediate cause of my change in political philosophy was the tariff of 1828. But the underlying cause, however, dates to the first Congress and the political philosophy of Secretary of the Treasury, Hamilton, as set forth, as I said above, in his report on manufacturers to the House of Representatives during the four, first Washington administration. <laughs> Hamilton said, the national legislature has express, express authority to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, and to provide for the common defense and general welfare, with no other qualifications except three. A, that all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. B, that no capitation or other direct tax <coughs> shall be laid unless in proportion to numbers as ascertained by sentence, census or enumeration, taken upon the principles described in the Constitution. And third, C, that no duty or tax shall be laid on articles exported from any state. Hamilton continued, these three qualifications accepted. The power to raise money is plenary and indefinite, and the objects to which it may be appropriated are no less comprehensive than the payment of the public debts and providing for the common defense and general welfare. He went on to say the term general welfare, terms general welfare, were doubtless intended to signify more than was expressed or imported in the other terms which preceded. Otherwise, numerous exigencies incident to the affairs of the nation would have been left without a provision. The phrase general welfare is as, is as comprehensive as any that could have been used because it was not fit that the constitutional authority of the Union to appropriate its revenues should have been restricted within narrower limits than the general welfare. And because this necessarily embraces a vast variety of particulars which are susceptible neither to specification nor definition. It is therefore of necessity left to the discretion of the national legislature, he was talking about Congress, to pronounce upon what objects concern the general welfare and for which under that description an appropriation of money is requisite and proper. The only qualification of the generality of the phrase in question, which seems to be admissible, is this. The object to which the appropriation of money is to be made be general and not local. Its operation extending in fact or possibility throughout the Union <coughs> and not being confined to a particular spot. He went on to say, no objection ought to arise to this construction from a supposition that it would apply a power to do whatever else should appear to Congress conductive to the general welfare. A power to appropriate money with this latitude, which is granted, 
in express terms, would not carry a power to do any other thing not authorized by the Constitution, either expressly or by fair implication. Now, to understand the dangers posed by Secretary Hamilton's report, it is first necessary to understand the relationship of the state governments to the federal government as set out in our Constitution. I'm going to digress for a minute and talk very briefly about the Constitution of 1787, our present Constitution. When our country had found the Articles of Confederation were inadequate to deal with the problems of the young nation, delegates were sent to Philadelphia to come up with proposed revisions. That Constitutional Convention convened on May 25, 1787. That convention was divided into two parties, one which favored a national government, and the other was in favor of a federal government. The national party <coughs> consisted for the most part of the younger and more talented but less experienced members of the body. The national party prevailed in the early stages of the proceedings. The party, however, in favor of the federal form, subsequently gained the ascendancy. The national party acquiesced, but without surrendering their preference for their own plan. The draft constitution that was produced was clearly designed to create a federal form of government. The design was to delegate certain specified powers to the new national government of the United States while reserving all other powers to the governments of the several states or to the people themselves. Those powers of a more general character were specifically delegated to the new government of the United States. All the others not delegated were reserved to the states or the people. Thus, each within its appropriate sphere possesses all the attributes and performs all the functions of government. The two as combined were designed to form one entire and perfect government. The powers delegated to Congress. The proposed Constitution as sent to the states for ratification contained 18 specific delegations of power to Congress. The other powers not delegated to Congress are known as the reserve powers. And the Tenth Amendment specifically provides that the powers not delegated to the United States by this Constitution, nor prohibited, it to it, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The specific powers delegated to Congress are found in Article I, Section 8. Because of time constraints, I intend only to refer to two of those delegated powers, those that are relevant to this here disquisition. Article 1, Section 8, 1 says, The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, excises, to pay the debts and to provide for the general defense and, and common, pardon me, common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties and imposts and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. And then the 18th power. Congress shall have power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution and the government of the United States or any department or officer thereof. The Nationalists regarded the proposed plan as but an experiment, but determined as honest men and good patriots to give it a fair trial. As part of that effort, they even assumed the name Federalists. Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison, while the ratification of the Constitution was pending, wrote the Federalist Papers, the object of which was to secure passage of the new Constitution. Their writings did much to explain and to secure its ratification. But as the Federalist Papers show, at the same time, 
its authors had not abandoned their predilection in favor of the national plan. When the government went into operation, Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Madison filled prominent places in the new government. <coughs> Hamilton became the first Secretary of the Treasury. <clears throat> By then, the most influential posts belonging to the in the executive department, the president accepted. Mr. Madison became a member of the House of Representatives at a time when it was a much more influential body than the Senate. No positions were better calculated to give the Nationalists control over the, na the actions of the government. <coughs> Hamilton began almost immediately to give our new Constitution a nationalist construction. I again refer to his report on manufacturers to the House. In addition to what I stated above, Mr. Hamilton asserted that it belonged to the discretion of Congress alone to determine which objects concern the general welfare and for which an appropriation of money is proper. He wrote, there seems to be no doubt that whatever concerns the general interests of agriculture, manufacturers, and commerce is within the sphere of the national councils as far as regards the application of money. He then set out his key point, the power of Congress to authorize the expenditure of public monies is not limited by the direct grants of legislative power found in the Constitution but is in addition thereto. This was a bold and unauthorized assumption that Congress had power to determine what objects belong to and what objects do not belong to the general welfare and to appropriate money at its discretion to such as it may deem to belong to it. No such power had been delegated to Congress, nor any, power, no, or any such power was necessary or proper to carry into those, to carry in execution those delegated powers. The point I'm making is the Constitution itself pronounced to what limits the general welfare extended and beyond which it did not extend. The powers delegated to Congress are found in Article 1, Section 8. It is only in the exercise of those delegated powers that Congress is authorized to act for the general welfare. All other powers not specifically delegated to Congress were reserved to the particular welfare of the respective states or the people. <clears throat>